This is CBC Here and Now. If he could have dialed 911, I'm sure he would have. I just thank my little dog for saving my life. We can't dial 911, but in the middle of the night, that howling Monaco knew something was terribly wrong. And tonight, you'll find out why this brave beagle is being called a hero. If you're just a regular person who decides to sell something online, does human rights law apply to you? It's not anything goes in the world of buy and sell, and now one person who posted is paying the price for bad behavior. Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. Well, a Mount Pearl couple is singing the praises of a canine hero. He's got a few years under his collar and he's not as nimble as he once was, but earlier this week, Monaco the Beagle did not let his family down. Here and Now is Mark Quinn with that story. <coughs> Monaco is a barker. <coughs> but now that Monaco is a lifesaver too, no one in this family minds what Monaco does one bit. Monaco is going to be getting anything and everything that he ever wanted. Anything and everything. <laughs> the treats are flowing, and here's why. Monaco woke his owner, Barry Abbott, out of a dead sleep during a medical emergency earlier this week. And I heard Monaco walking back and forth the hallway, which he never does. He's normally always in the living room until you get up the next morning. And he was uh, walking back and forth. And I don't know how long he was walking back and forth, but I just heard the... And I said, that's strange. I'm hearing the tapping of Monaco. What's going on? I, I got up, walked out, and found my wife passed out on the floor in the hallway. Sandra is good now, but was having a seizure when Monaco found her. It was a, the biggest fright I've ever experienced in my life, ever. Uh, first I thought, you know, looking at her face and her color and her, and her, you know, being so cold, I thought she was actually passed. And even the nurse, uh, or the doctor said yesterday over there, she said, your poor husband was some uh, frantic when, when they came to the house, but it was, how can you not be with her for so long? I don't remember anything about what happened. All I remember is waking up in the hospital and wondering why I was there. Like they said, Monaco is a good dog who gets what he wants. If he could have dialed 911, I'm sure he would have. <laughs> They're all back together now, and Barry and Sandra Abbott say it's all thanks to their gray-haired 10-year-old superhero, Monaco. Mark Quinn, CBC News, Mount Pearl. Well, eight years after a nasty exchange on Kijiji, a seller is now being made to pay up. And that's for discriminating against a potential buyer. And it's a ruling that means that your everyday buy and sell users now have some ethics to uphold or risk paying the price. Here now is Ariana Kellett reports. It's something a lot of us do all the time, buy and sell goods online. And in most cases, it goes off without a hitch. But in November of 2011, a man complained to the Human Rights Commission. He said that he was discriminated against because of his race by someone selling a car on Kijiji. It's all here. Aubrey Lynch's ad specified no emails, but Saad reached out anyway with a counteroffer. Lynch's response, quote, your first step when you move here from another country is learn how to read English. Your next step is learn this is not a country of donations. Now do not email me again. And it didn't end there. Saad hurled an insult at Lynch. Lynch again told Saad to learn English. I guess the complainant felt that based on his last name and the fact that he had a MUN email account, um, replied back with discriminatory language, basically told this person, to, you know, if you can't read English, don't bother emailing me, go back to where you came from, that sort of language. That was 2011. This past July, a decision came down from an adjudicator. Not only did she order Lynch to pay Saad $1,500, she also ruled that you cannot discriminate when selling goods and services, and that applies to selling things online. What I find interesting about this case is that it applies to the online commercial relationship. So if you put something up on Kijiji or even Facebook Marketplace, um, it's, there's the potential that human rights law uh, would apply to this, and that means that you can't discriminate in who you're selling to. So how often does this happen? Someone getting turned away because of their skin color, religion, or gender? 
The commission says this case in particular is rare, but it's possible that some people just don't come forward to report it. Spreading the word about how this might apply to online relationships might send more people our way. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as more and more business is conducted this way, it's something that the law uh, will have to grapple with. So buyer and seller, both beware. If you're selling something online, human rights law applies to you. And in the end, it could ultimately cost you. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. Well, that stormy system that Ashley has had her eye on all week is right on our doorstep, and there are lots of weather warnings to tell you about. We have a snowfall warning in effect for Gander down through Clarenville, and the entire island is looking at a special weather statement for tonight. This is how it's going to play out. We're going to see a shot of snow for the Avalon Peninsula uh, in the morning, but that's going to start to clear as we get in later in the morning with a heavy, heavy rainfall there. The snow will track through central towards the west coast and uh, dump some snow on the west coast there. We also have a snowfall warning in effect for Makovic. 30 to 40 centimeters expected from now until Sunday and a weather statement right along the coast and up through Happy Valley Goose Bay. I'll get into all of those details a bit later. Anthony. Well, now to a clarification about a report from last night. It was about the Dicker family in Nain who are renovating a house in the community. And the story said that the Dickers blamed delays in the delivery of building material on the Hamatic W. That's the ferry that's operated by Labrador Marine. Well, CBC failed to ask the company for comment about the story. Labrador Marine contacted CBC and provided shipping details as well as dates. And that information indicates that there were no delays related to the ferry. The lumber that the Dickers are waiting on was not shipped from the supplier to Labrador Marine Terminal until late October. The story indicated the Dickers did not receive any of their four shipments. In fact, three shipments have already been delivered to Nain. Canada's top court has dismissed an appeal to review the Ann Norris case. The Provincial Court of Appeal unanimously rejected the appeal earlier this year. In 2018, a 12-person jury found Norris not criminally responsible for the death of Marcel Reardon in 2016. Now, Norris admitted to killing the 46-year-old, striking him repeatedly in the head with a hammer. Norris's defense team said she couldn't be found criminally responsible, citing a long history of struggles with mental illness. Now, the Crown argued that she knew what she was doing. The Supreme Court did not say why it would not hear an appeal. Well, now to Labrador, where the new lawyer for a Happy Valley Goose Bay cab driver accused of sexually assaulting a teenager wants a mistrial. Earlier this year, uh, the, somebody testified that Joseph Co Cooney sexually assaulted her when she was 14 years old. I should say that was a girl who testified about that. Today in court, Cooney's new lawyer, Jonathan Regan, asked for a mistrial stemming from issues that he found after taking over the case from Edmund Montague. Montague left legal aid for a new job, and Regan told the judge that he had issues with some of the language translation that took place during the trial, as well as Montague's cross-examination of the girl. He called Montague's counsel ineffective and noted that Montague failed to ask any questions of the complainant about the alleged incident. Crown Prosecutor Renee Coates did not support the call for a mistrial. She instead suggested the witness be recalled for further testimony, and that matter is back in court in January. Well, for children who experience violence and abuse in this province, talking about it is difficult. A child might tell a school teacher that they were hurt at home, and that could start a process in which they end up talking to a social worker and then police and then other authorities. Well, soon, a new centre in St. John's will bring all of those different agencies under one roof. As Here and Now's Megan McCabe reports, the idea is to put kids first. Suffering physical or sexual violence is bad enough for a child, let alone having to tell the story over and over to a series of adults in stark rooms. They may have to tell their story to a social worker at Child Protection, they may have to tell it again to the police, they may have to tell it again to a doctor and then to a prosecutor, um, and that can be a really scary part of the whole experience for children who've already experienced scary things. This diagram helps explain how the process works today compared to how it will look when a new child and youth advocacy center opens here. It's basically a one-stop shop focused on children, similar to other centers across Canada. 
KSSNL spearheaded the project. It's an organization that the province pays to help care for kids in the child protection system. And it's working with other agencies that are already involved in dealing with child abuse. Kids will have rooms like this one, with toys on hand to help them tell their stories. child goes once, they tell the story once, and everybody that's working in the center is specially trained um, to deal with that particular type of situation. And so it really streamlines the process for children and makes it much more supportive, safe and comfortable than what we currently have in, in it's very fragmented. This center is separate from the Office of the Child and Youth Advocate, as confusing as the names may be. But the advocate says her office has long heard complaints from young people trying to report abuse and that the new center uses resources we already have in a better way. We have seen so many situations and over the years have done investigations where the fragmentation of service uh, has resulted in young people falling through gaps. And when those services, when those opportunities to coordinate and tie responses together are missed, young people lose out. Five years of federal funding is getting the ball rolling with key assets putting up the rest. They plan to open the new center in their space on Water Street in the spring. Once they make some room by moving administrative offices here to this old Salvation Army building on Adams Avenue that the company recently bought. Megan McCabe, CBC News, St. John's. Health Minister John Hagee says the province does not have a crisis when it comes to family doctors. The Newfoundland and Labrador Medical Association released a report yesterday saying that we need 60 family physicians right now to address the shortage. Almost 100,000 people in this province don't have access to a family doctor, but Hagee says the government is making strides to fix it trying to move, and the NLMA I think, are trying to move from a 1960s, 1970s model of care which is siloed into the 20th century. But you the minister don't think this is a crisis? I don't like people putting words in my mouth. I think if you have a problem with your family doctor and don't have one, I'm not trying to minimize that. But if you do go on the website today, you will find there's a new practice in St. John's taking patients. Wasn't there three weeks ago. So Yes, there's a problem. Yes, we have acknowledged that. Happy to hear what the NLMA have got to say. Delighted to speak to Dr. Peachy. He and I have already opened a dialogue. And we have made significant strides in primary care over the last three years. A Torbay man has been slapped with a major fine for tax evasion. Gary Evans is the owner of St. John's Aircraft Services, and the company was contra contracted to de-ice planes at the St. John's International Airport. But Evans failed to report nearly $2.6 million in revenue between 2009 to 2013, meaning he owes $685,000 in federal taxes. And on top of paying what he owes to the CRA, plus interest and penalties, Evans has been ordered to pay more than $600,000 in fines. He was also sentenced to 12 months house arrest. Well, police services in Mount Pearl are not as accessible as they used to be. The RNC has suspended counter service at the detachment on Clyde Avenue. This after the officer previously assigned to that job decided to retire. Well, now visitors are greeted with a sign and the sign is all that's there as opposed to a person. That sign and they're encouraged to use a phone inside the foyer to contact police headquarters in St. John's. As the counter service, the full-time counter service in Mount Pearl ended? Uh, right now we're still evaluating the most efficient way to take reports from our community. Uh, as I mentioned, online reporting is, is certainly uh, uh, being researched right now. Uh, you know, it's about accessibility. Uh, we want people to be able to report and feel safe doing so. Uh, you know what, uh, it's about uh, serving our community and, and uh, working together on that. Okay. Meanwhile, front counter service continues to be offered at the new RNC detachment in Conception Bay South, though on Thursday afternoon the service didn't appear to be available. Cadigan says counter service will continue in CBS because there's a higher volume of reporting at that detachment. I mean, at the end of the day, it's about operational requirements. How do we have officers available to take reports, op officers available to respond to calls, investigate crimes, and we want to most efficiently do that for our community. And, uh, you know, right now this is the... Uh, most efficient way to operate. Well, in the words of Shanigannuck, it's the only place where you see an old man get up with a shotgun in front of 40,000 people and nobody gets nervous. Well, that man, now I'm giving the secret away, that man was Bruce Neal. Neal passed away Tuesday at the age of 93 and for 40 years, 
He was the gentleman who fired the starting gun at the Royal St. John's Regatta. Neil spent a total of 71 years on the Regatta Committee. And back in 1978, he even stood side by side with the Queen for the start of those races. Neil passed away at Kenny's Pond Retirement Home, surrounded by family. Welcome back to the program. First, we start with breaking news. Temperatures are dropping into the minus single digits. Time now to check in with our Carolyn Stokes. It is just packed with people. The company says it's picking up salmon. Looks like an absolutely gorgeous afternoon. Uh, good to see you. Good to see you too. Uh, Welcome back. Nice to see you. Before <laughs> we get to the weather, uh, I want to share an invention with you now. This is from the mind of a man in Moose Jaw. Yes, one super Canadian ice fishing accessory. <laughs> That's Adam oh. Butler, and he created this. Now, he calls it the dipstick. <laughs> yeah, that collapsible tube. It lowers into the ice. Not to get fish. No, no, no. A far more practical purpose, it will keep your drinks cold. Oh. And they won't freeze, and they won't float away, and there's always one bobbing at the surface just waiting there for you. But don't get any ideas. Adam's already got a patent on this thing, and he sells them online. So there you go. Isn't that clever? The dipstick, just in time wow. for Christmas. <laughs> and a little bit of product placement as well yeah, yeah. Anyhow. and do you ever go ice fishing i know you like salmon i fishing, used to but... a long time ago but i was thinking uh, my dad would love that <laughs> mm. 
Yeah. So there you go. A dip stick. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, every time you end up doing weather, it's almost like the I know, it's funny. worst, most difficult <laughs> college final exam when you think it's going to be easy, right? Yeah, yeah. Lots of weather on the way. I right. mean, Ashley has been looking at the system all week, but it's just it's right here going to hit us tonight. Okay. So let's just let's just get into it, shall we? Uh, so this is this evening. Uh, just to start with Labrador along the coast there, Makovic in particular, just persistent snow just keeps going and going on the island. About 2 a.m. is when the snow is going to hit the Avalon Peninsula. It won't stick around for very long. It's pretty fast moving, only about two to four centimeters expected there. That will start to mix with the rain in behind. So overnight low zero. The wind's not too bad to start off, but they will start to pick up tomorrow uh, along central. Some drizzly weather expected there tonight, as well as with uh, Saint Anthony and mostly cloudy on the west coast and light winds up through Labrador. Uh, the coast seeing more of that snow that's been sticking around. Minus six is the overnight low there. Winds fairly strong, gusting up to, to 50 there. And uh, very cold in Labrador City, minus 15 overnight tonight. So here are some of the warnings in place. I mentioned earlier we have a snowfall warning in effect for Gander down through Clarenville. About 10 to 20 centimeters expected to fall with this system. The whole island is under a special weather statement because it's just going to get really messy. Uh, lots and lots of rain for places. Now you can see here the high elevation, 30 to 50 centimeters. That's how much snow is expected to fall like along the long range mountains. That's not what's expected to fall in like the Corner Brook area. It should be lighter there. So we also have some warnings in place for Labrador snowfall warning for Mikovic, 30 to 40 centimeters. That's between tonight right through until Sunday. So that snow will continue to persist. Special weather statement for the coast up through uh, Happy Valley Goose Bay, 15 to 30 centimeters expected there through until Sunday as well. So overnight Friday moving into tomorrow, that snow will pass the Avalon and work its way west. We have this heavy, heavy rain coming in through the morning. So when you wake up, the snow will probably be over and it'll probably be raining fairly hard if you're on the Avalon Peninsula. Uh, moving in through central, that's when the snow is going to start around 10 a.m. Uh, and continue through most of the day. It's going to be very heavy, wet snow and Corner Brook looking at some mixed precipitation throughout the day tomorrow and uh, that heavier snowfall along the higher elevations. So this is the outlook for tomorrow. 30 to 50 millimeters of rain expected with this system. So that's for St. John's, Fairyland, all those areas. Uh, as we get into central, it's more of a snow uh, event, a mixed precipitation event, 10 to, 10, uh, 10 to 20 centimeters for the areas I mentioned earlier, Gander down through Clarenville, and it's going to be windy as well. So it's just going to be really unpleasant. Moving over to the west coast, two to four centimeters expected for the Corner Brook area, and now all that will be mixed with some rain. Similar story along the straits. Temperatures above zero too, which is causing that uh, warm uh, mix between the the wet. Uh, rain and the snow and for Labrador 10 to 15 centimeters expected to more for the Makovic area and two to four for Happy Valley Goose Bay and Labrador City pretty much the only place that's not going to get a taste of this tomorrow. I'll have a look at your long range forecast a little later. Thanks, Carol. Farmers in central Newfoundland say they are shorthanded in their battle against munching moose. The animals roam onto their fields, eat their crops, and are costing thousands of dollars. And recent changes to provincial legislation mean that farmers can't fire back at night. Here now is Garrett Barry has that story. With the, sometimes you'll find them with the teeth marks in, don't they? Another cabbage ruined at Triple E Farms. People want to picture perfect uh, product on the shelf. Uh, you, can't, you can't put that on the shelf at all. He says this is one of the worst years yet. Moose have cost his business thousands. It wouldn't be so bad if you eat the full entire head <laughs> and add to a tree and went on, on their merry way, but they'll, they'll just take one little bite of each one. The same story down the highway at this plum orchard. You can really see the damage. That's why they're all leaning because they've been <laughs> walking them down. Uh, and they go and nip off the tender shoots, which are going to produce next year's fruit. Um, and uh, really set us back. Yeah. Electric fences aren't much use. 
moose break through anyway. And over the last few years, regulations have changed, banning shooting at night. There's a reason why nowhere in North America is hunting at night allowed, and it's because the firing of high-powered rifles in the dark uh, does pose a serious safety risk to the general public. But Evely says his farm is in the middle of nowhere. We've never had a problem. I've been at this for 26 years and never had a problem with it before. So boy, uh, boy is the issue now, right? Instead of shooting, government says farmers can buy crop insurance or call in conservation officers when they spot a moose. Thornley says that sounds like a game of cat and mouse. But they're going to come back. And uh, for us to stay awake 24-7 or have someone here or something, uh, it just... These Brussels sprouts were part of a government program aimed to diversify the crops grown here. It should be this tall. The farmers say that shows the contradictions in provincial policy, trying to double food production but leaving farmers' crops vulnerable. Garrett Berry, CBC News, Campbellton. Well, he's the face of basketball in this province, and now he can add author to his list of achievements. Here now is Jeremy Eaton. Sits down with superstar Carl English to talk about his new book. Stay tuned.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Carl English is the province's most prolific basketball player, and his story has been told all over the world. But for the first time, he's telling it in his own words. Now, people know parts of the story. His parents died in a house fire when he was five. He rose from the homemade hoop on Route 100 to the University of Hawaii, to the doorstep of the NBA, to a very successful career in Europe, and then full circle back to St. John's, where he played with the Edge for the last two years. And his new book, Chasing a Dream, the Carl English Story, is set to hit shelves in the coming days. And joining us to talk about it is Carl. Thanks for coming out, Carl. Thanks for having me, buddy. So why? Why now? It's been almost 20 years since you uh, made a name for yourself as a basketball player. Why write this book now? Uh, it's a long time coming. Uh, the first time I was asked was my freshman year in Hawaii. Um, I think once we made the, had started start having success and made the NCAA tournament, people got to hear my story. They send TV crews here from CBS to, to write across the country. And since then, I've been asked to write it. But it's a difficult story to really embellish and really tell for me. And once I dug into it and I said, okay, now is the time, it was a bit of a nightmare, you know, because I'm reliving all this negativity. As, as a, I call myself a seasoned vet with the media, I don't let them in to things that I don't want them to know. You can ask me any which way you want, but I'm not going to let you in. But with this book, I, I told everything. I told from, obviously, my early tragedies um, up to dealing with that as a teenager, on through my struggles and teacher strikes and getting cut by the NBA and losing all that money and so on and so forth. And then at that time, living it is one thing because I'm, I'm taught and I'm bred a certain way that once things go wrong, I bury it, work harder, and try to achieve greatness. And that's, that's just how I've been my whole life. But when I reflected on this book and I sat down and I did it, it was tough, man. It was really, really, really tough. Did it bring back bad memories? Was it difficult for you? Was it painful for you to retell this story? Because a lot of people know your story, myself included. I made a documentary about you. But there's a lot of stuff that I didn't know in this book. Was it painful? Yeah, it was beyond painful. I'd look at Mandy when I'd lay down at nighttime, and I was just physically, emotionally, and I was just wiped. I was totally drained. We spent about f over 50 hours recording in seven, eight days. Just he asking me and I just tell him my whole story, but detailed as possible. And then we got another 10 hours on a, a recurring visit. And then in between, just when he was writing and putting all my words to paper, um, I thought it'd be therapeutical, but it was, it was tough. But it's a, it's a story that I felt was t the time to tell. Um, I felt full circle and coming back home and I saw the impact that I could have on the province. But then I look at it as motivation, determination, perseverance, all the things that sum me up as a person. And then I also looked at it as, it's, I looked at Michael Jordan as a role player, but it's not realistic. I looked at Steve Nash as a role player, a role model. It's not, you know, it's hard to obtain, but the way I look at it is for, for local kids and, and national Canadians right across the country, you could look at someone like me and say, you know, I can achieve that or better if I put my nose down, work hard, and and dedicate myself to the craft and and that's what I wanted to get out of it I want people to know the true me um, and if you're dealing with something in your life like it's gonna take you to dark places it's gonna take you to happy places but then also you know if you're dealing with anything in your life you can look to me and look to this book as you know motivation and you know a way to get out of it how does it feel for you to have your story told now to the province in your own words well I think when we told the story last year a lot of people were blown away by it you know and I saw the impact you know especially when you're at the games and you're out in the community I'm, I'm out in the community a fair bit and people come up to me and I'm like oh you're my favorite player and your story is so inspiring and I you know so I felt this was another way, you know, to help out someone that's dealing with these things. And then also it's a, it's a testimonial to who I am as a person. But then it also pushes Newfoundland, it pushes my roots, it pushes... I want people to look at this, and especially kids, to say, I got a dream, I can achieve it. You know, here's a kid that lost his parents at a young age, didn't let it stop him. I played the majority of my basketball on the side of the street on a homemade hoop. If you can find motivation in that, what else do you need? Can't let you go without asking. Uh, St. John's Edge are going to set to open training camp uh, next month. Uh, your name hasn't been thrown around. Uh, will you be playing with the Edge this year? Uh, you know, coming back home was a full circle for me, like we talked about. It's been something that, you know, it allowed me. The biggest part of all this, it gave me a platform to help so many people, and especially kids in our province, and that I'll never forget that. 
Um, for me currently, there's some contractual obligations between the edge from last season that they have to upheld. And, you know, hopefully we're, we're talking and we can figure that out. But currently I'm, I'm not involved until those things are rectified. So let's see. Thanks, Jeremy. And we're going to stay with sports, a serious sports story. An ex-NHL player is calling his former coach Bill Peters' apology misleading and insincere. Akeem Alou has alleged that the Calgary Flames coach used racial slurs against him in the past, and now he says he'll meet with league officials to discuss the matter. CBC's Simon Dingley with the latest. Jeff Ward's first game behind the bench. The Calgary Flames played last night's game under a cloud. Assistant coach Jeff Ward replaced head coach Bill Peters. Peters is accused of misconduct. Here comes Camilleri to Alou. Gain a little room on Fowler. Plays it, they score! Former NHLer Akeem Alou alleges Peters hurled racial slurs in his presence a decade ago while both were in the American Hockey League. Yesterday, Peters penned a letter of apology to Flames general manager Brad Treliving, writing, I know that my comments have been the source of both anger and disappointment, and I understand why. Although it was an isolated and immediately regrettable incident, I take responsibility for what I said. The team is investigating. It's involving um, serious subject matter, and I just want to make sure that we are doing um, a thorough job in, in, in looking under every stone, rock, and doing all the things that need to be done. Alou was not addressed in Peter's apology. He calls it misleading, insincere, and concerning. And he's accepted an invitation to meet with the NHL. Peters is also expected to meet with League Brass to plead his case. I would be surprised if Bill Peters is the coach of the Calgary Flames next week. This Ottawa sports lawyer says there is a strong case to fire the Calgary coach. If the Flames uh, discover that Bill Peters used the N-word, and it appears that Bill Peters has admitted to using it in his written apology, then to keep him as the head coach will have an adverse business impact on the Flames and the NHL. Don't forget, the majority of, NF uh, of NHL teams are south of the border. The N-word, as we know, is profoundly offensive and, frankly, toxic. Here's a chance. Lino backhand, scores! The Flames' next game is Saturday. There is no word yet if Peters will be back behind the bench. Simon Dingley, CBC News, Toronto. I work on some watches up to 330 parts in an instrument the size of a tuning. And, you know, there's a whole lot going on in there. Well, time flies when you're in the watch business. Coming up, we'll meet the Stricklands as they mark a milestone.
Welcome back to Here Now. Well, there are many ways to pass the time, but the best way to keep it is with a good watch. Well, next week, the Stricklands are going to celebrate 20 years in the watch business, this at Grand Time in downtown St. John's. But while Apple Watches and Fitbits now compete for spaces on our wrists, the Stricklands say an old-fashioned watch will always keep a place in our hearts. Here now's Zach Gowdy has their story. When Barry Strickland looks through his magnifying glass, he doesn't see a watch, he sees time. And there he goes. That watch hasn't worked properly in probably 40, 50 years. And that's the first life it's had in so long. For 20 years, Barry and Rachel Yenny Strickland have been watching out for watches. On December 1st, 1999, they opened a tiny shop in downtown St. John's called Grand Time. And after all that time, they're still here. How's the watch doing? The number one. That's good. Wear it all time. Okay. Still working like no a No spread. I got that prep for you. Put it on for you right away. Today, like most days, the shop is busy. Rachel helps a steady march of customers find the perfect look and fit. A lot of time what I notice is that the first watch that attracts your attention very often is the watch you're going to get. So go with your gut feeling. Barry keeps his eye on repairs, but with his Swiss trained hands, he's more surgeon than repairman. I work on some watches up to 330 parts in an instrument the size of a tuning. And you know, there's a whole lot going on in there. And uh, when you hand it back to the customer, and they're like, okay, great, my calendar works, my stopwatch works, and that's great. But if they had any idea what's actually going on on the inside, it would probably scare them. Because it's the same with people, you know. If, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't want to open up and have a look in and go, ooh, right? And Barry knows what this watch means to the man who brought it in. It's part of his life story, a small piece of himself. He's had that watch his whole life and it means everything to him, everything he's been through, when he got married, when his kids were born, his career, that watch has been with him. That's his buddy. And it's uh, up to me to make sure that, that, that you know, the old friend is with him for the long haul. This Lately, the watch, watch business has seen some big changes. There are new gadgets competing for our wrists. This watch tells time and turns on lights and opens up doors. They look and feel like a watch, but they are so much more, and somehow so much less. They're just electronic instruments. There's nothing sentimental with an electronic instrument. Whereas a wristwatch, for example, the one that I was working here today, I mean, that's 60 years old. That's just been restored to the day as good as new. And that, as I said, belonged to the father of the gentleman who owns it. And he can't wait to get that and wear it, and especially be proud of a Christmas day. Do you see people handing down their Apple watches to their yeah. children in that way? <laughs> <laughs> Never. In a digital world, Grand Time is defiantly analog, selling only mechanical watches. But their customers like it that way. Well, if you look at a watch dial, you can see the time pass. So it's completely different than looking at digital time. We just see numbers flashing. But here you can see where you are. You know that when the hands are at the top, it's going to be lunchtime or it's going to be midnight. You glance at it and you see it. You don't really need to know exactly what time it is. You get an idea or a feeling for what the time is. After 20 years behind this counter, Barry and Rachel Yenny Strickland definitely have a feeling for time. And to them, these tiny wonders that keep time will always be timeless. Zach Gowdy, CBC News, St. John's. Well, to a story from Ontario now, but a very different kind of technology that police are using to try to help frontline officers improve their understanding of how others are feeling. A new virtual reality training system that will offer them the perspective to see the world the way somebody with a mental health issue does when they're being approached by a police officer. Here's Talia Ricci with how the system works. Halton police say this piece of technology is going to help put them in the shoes of people they might be dealing with who are experiencing mental health issues. We'll show you how it works. You can pop that over your head there. Uh, we have uh, three modules that are there, aut autism, schizophrenia, and suicide prevention. They can look, they look around inside and it's 360 degrees and they pick which, tr which training module they want to do. For this exercise, the person completing the training enters a virtual reality world where there's someone living with autism. Sir, 
I'm gonna need you to come back inside and paper that, certain. You have to come back inside. <laughs> Sir, what's going on? Talk to us, what's happening? Hey, you need to stay He's back. Autistic. You need to stay He's back. Autistic. For the first two minutes or so, you are that person who is, uh, who is, who, uh, who has autism, who is has schizophrenic, or is in a suicidal place. Uh, and then after a couple minutes, it flips, and you are the responding officer. We have a report of an aggressive male suspect shoplifting and fighting with an employee. We need you to calm down. And then they're faced with decisions. The hope is that after the officer has experienced the perspective of the person they're approaching, they'll have a new mindset. When the officers come, you can tell that that creates a level of anxiety for them. And I think that gives me the kind of impression that I need to understand that if I arrive to that situation, I need to know that this person is in crisis and under stress. Partner, let's kill the lights and turn the radio down, all right? The company developing the technology says scenarios involving people with dementia or who are hard of hearing are in the works. The nice thing about that is that you don't have to pull people off of shift for four hours or eight hours. This is something that they can spend five minutes on in an immersive scenario on before their shift or after their shift and then get the real um, development of their empathy based on those scenarios. Go ahead and check the store and see if you can find his parent. All right, we'll do. I'm sorry, officer, for any trouble. He's autistic. All right. All right. So right now there are those three scenarios, but Axon says they plan to develop three more in 2020. And while Halton is the first police service in Canada to use this technology, it's expected to be used across the GTA in the next couple of years. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Oakville. Welcome back. So today is going to be absolutely gorgeous compared <laughs> to what's coming. Oh boy, yeah. It's yeah. it's we have some weather moving through tonight in the east, and you know it's just going to stay a bit nasty right through the weekend. Okay. Right now is how it's looking, anyways. So let's uh, have a quick recap of tomorrow because there is a lot of weather on the way. Five degrees is the high in St. John's. You can see the winds gusting up to 70, so it's going to be a lot of rain tomorrow. Uh, 30 to 50 millimeters of rain. There is that uh, warning in effect uh, for the entire island. Uh, the
the weather statement in effect rather, and the snowfall warning for the Gander area, Terra Nova, and uh, uh, down through Clarenville. So about 10 to 20 centimeters of, of uh, snow expected there. Moving up through to Labrador, the snow will persist tomorrow along the coast. Lab City looking like the nicest place, probably a mix of sun and cloud of minus 14 as the high. So we're into Friday night now, and that's when things are going to get worse for Labrador. You can see Friday night, the rain is still continuing for uh, the Avalon Peninsula and that messy mix in between that line right down through between rain and snow splitting the island there and uh, the snow on the west coast will be pretty heavy wet snow and it'll be very much mixed precipitation and lots of snow persisting along the coast in Labrador right through until Saturday. Here we are Saturday five o'clock and uh, still pretty drizzly in the east. The flurries continuing for the west and snow continuing along the coast as well. The temperatures bump up a little bit. St. John seven degrees on Saturday, but it will continue to be pretty dreary uh, and for central areas. Similar story, some rain and some drizzle uh, and along the coast that messy mix of snow and rain up through Labrador Lab City staying fairly clear minus 11 as the high on Saturday and staying messy there along the Labrador coast. So Saturday night into Sunday, it still continues. Really, we're looking at a bit of a snowfall for the Avalon Peninsula. Could see some flurries on Sunday right up along the coast and the west coast there as well. And continuing for uh, Labrador, the uh, southeastern portion of Labrador. So then as we get into Monday, we're looking at a bit of a reprieve. So this is Sunday, two degrees with some flurries for the St. John's area, flurries for Grand Falls, Windsor, Gander, and uh, as well for Corner Brook in Labrador. Lab City staying fairly nice, minus 11 though, very chilly. And uh, there's the reprieve I mentioned on Monday. Finally, things are going to start to clear off for a little bit. Zero on Monday for the east and then some more rain moving in on Tuesday for central. A very similar story, a messy mix moving in on Tuesday. Minus two is the high on Monday for western Labrador. Flurries continuing throughout uh, that five day forecast. They're moving up into Labrador. It's a mix of sun and cloud as you begin the work week and for west. Western Labrador, things will start to get uh, a little gray there. Minus 11 as the high with some flurries. So that's your forecast. Anthony, back to you. All right, thanks, Carolyn. Now to some sad national news tonight. Authorities have confirmed seven people died in yesterday's fatal plane crash in Kingston, Ontario. Investigators are combing through the site to determine just what caused the crash. Transportation Safety Board of, uh, of Canada has uh, dispatched uh, four investigators from both our uh, Toronto Regional Office and our, and our head office who uh, arrived on the site this morning, and uh, we're going to uh, gather as much information as we can from the accident site. The Transportation Safety Board of Canada says it will be working with its American counterpart because the plane was registered in the United States. Initial reports suggest the plane crashed in a wooded area just south of the 401. That happened about 5 p.m. The TSB says the plane took off from Buttonville Airport north of Toronto and was headed to Kingston. The crash took place about seven kilometers north of its destination. No official cause has been established, but the area was under a wind advisory when the plane crash happened. When out of politics, Conservative leader Andrew Scheer is defiant in the face of infighting within his party over his leadership, and he's vowing to stay at the helm and to fight for his job after a disappointing result in last month's election. I am staying on to fight the fight that Canadians elected us to do. Uh, there are very serious risks facing this country, and Canadians expect us to stay united and stay focused on the job at hand, and that's precisely what I'm going to do. Now, those comments came during a planned announcement earlier today. Scheer introduced the party's new number two, Conservative deputy leader, that is, Toronto area MP Leona Alislev. She crossed the floor more than a year ago. She was originally elected as a Liberal but joined the Conservative Party expressing dissatisfaction with the Trudeau government's handling of the economy. Pretty easy to guess where in the province this photo was taken, but just a stunning shot. Just look at the reflection in the water. I'll let you know where this was taken after the break. You're taking it easy on me. <laughs> it's your first day back.
Well, wind down the show with something a little quirky. Yeah. There's a European company that makes cleaning products and it's teaming up with a brewery. Yes, a brewery to make a beer based dish soap. And to top it off, the world's largest brewer says the Sudsy soap. Well, actually, I knew I couldn't resist putting suds in there, right? Uh, it's actually going to reduce industrial waste. Wow, this is very yeah. bizarre. In their own words, here's how they make what they call too good to waste detergent. In the beginning, when we were producing non alcoholic beer, we had very little quantities of rest alcohol. So there was no real partner to find. But as those amounts were growing, the, the, the brewery was asking us, okay, what can we do with the alcohol? Because it's piling up, it's a lot of our quantity. And so that's why we were looking for partners. So we have been co-developing with Ecover to make sure that the alcohol that we were producing as a byproduct was meeting their expectations as an incoming product for their development. When they extract the alcohol, um, we noticed that it needs to undergo uh, a cleaning step, but then it's put into trucks, transported here to Ecover, um, and we put it uh, in our product as an ingredient, as an active ingredient. There's still a little bit of the, the, the beer smell uh, that was in, in the alcohol. So the fragrance we used to mask the beer smell also comes from uh, uh, agricultural waste streams. As we have our 2025 sustainability goals as well, we definitely focus on circular economy and we want to upcycle all our uh, uh, co-products. Next time someone says to me, I'll, you should wash your out, mouth out with soap. <laughs> it won't be a problem. I'll be like, okay. Right, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> now, this might make consumers happy, but you should know a lot of cows not so happy because the brewery used to sell the leftover alcohol and the beer mash uh, as cattle feed. So that explains the look on a lot of cows' faces, actually. Now yeah. they won't get their beer mash anymore. Anyhow. <laughs> okay, so we have a great picture to show you. Uh, yeah, this is gross morn. Pretty easy to guess that, right? Great side too. Wonderful Just picture. Gorgeous, yeah, gorgeous shot. Yeah. Uh, Harrison Barney sent this in. Thank you very much, Harrison. And uh, if you have a weather photo you would like to share, please uh, send us an email at nlphotos at cbc.ca. Okay, well, I'm gonna head out and get some uh, beer soap <laughs> yeah. for uh, Christmas. I'm gonna get a dipstick. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird when you buy your soap in six packs. Yeah. Uh, but anyhow, what the you should dip like pair up the dipstick <laughs> <laughs> with the beer soap. Lots of gift ideas on here and now tonight. Uh, fill your boots. We'll be back tomorrow Friday already. We'll see you then. Yeah.